Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Robert Hansen? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoy this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I will put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll look at the background of this case, move to the timeline of the crime, then offer my analysis. Robert Philip Hansen was born on April 18, 1944, in Chicago, Illinois. His father, Howard, was a Chicago police officer. Robert endured physical and emotional mistreatment at the hands of his father. His mother said that Robert never objected to the way he was treated by his father. Rather, he isolated himself in his bedroom. Robert would spend hours reading books about spies and espionage. In school, Robert was routinely excluded from group activities and rarely talked to his classmates. They described him as having an air of self-importance. He only had a few close friends. One of these friends died when Robert was in the sixth grade. After this, Robert became even more withdrawn and had a deep sense of sadness. Robert's father wanted Robert to go to college and earn an advanced degree. He hoped that Robert would become a physician. Howard did not want his son to pursue a career in law enforcement. In college, Robert struggled because he did not put in the work. On one occasion, after starting a test, Robert simply left the classroom because he was unhappy with the first question. Despite his aversion to school, Robert earned a bachelor's degree in chemistry in 1966. He then enrolled in dental school. When he was in college, he worked as a recreational therapist at a state mental hospital. He dated a nurse who worked there named Bonnie. The couple married in 1968. A few days after their wedding, Bonnie discovered that Robert was cheating. He asked for forgiveness, and Bonnie let it go. Later, Robert would cheat on Bonnie several more times. About two weeks after the wedding, Robert dropped out of dental school and studied business. He earned an MBA in 1971. After briefly working as an accountant, Robert took a job with the Chicago Police Department in defiance of his father's wishes. Robert worked for internal affairs and viewed himself as an honest agent in a world of law-breaking police officers. Robert didn't get along too well with his co-workers, including his supervisors. They did not trust him. In 1976, he took a job with the FBI. Robert had senior-level security clearance and unrestricted access to vast quantities of classified information. He initially worked in Gary, Indiana, and was transferred to New York City in 1978. Now moving to the timeline of the crime. In 1979, Robert Hansen approached the Soviet Main Intelligence Directorate and offered his assistance as a spy. They agreed to pay Robert for government secrets. He supplied them with large quantities of information over the course of a few years, including lists of suspended Soviet intelligence agents. The Russian handlers did not know Robert's identity. He transferred information using a system of dead drops. So he would leave the information in various places, and the Russians would come and collect it later. In 1981, Robert was transferred to Washington, D.C. He moved his family to a nearby suburb in Virginia. In 1983, he was assigned to the Soviet Analytical Unit and was responsible for investigating the KGB and other Soviet intelligence organizations. His job was to identify Soviet spies. Robert was transferred back to New York City in 1985 and resumed contact with the Russians. On October 1 of that year, he sent a letter to the KGB asking for $100,000 in exchange for his services. He supplied the names of three KGB agents who were secretly working for the FBI. Two of those agents were executed by the Russians. Robert believed that he was responsible for their deaths. He was unaware that another spy had already revealed their identities to the KGB. In 1987, Robert was once again transferred to Washington, D.C. His job was to identify the spy who had betrayed the two agents who were executed. Robert believed he was looking for himself. In 1989, Robert supplied information about a Department of State official named Felix Block who had been suspected of espionage. The KGB stopped communicating with Felix 
which led to the FBI failing to build a case against him. Felix lost his job, but he was never charged with a crime. Investigators realized that someone had warned the KGB about Felix, and they started looking for a spy inside the FBI. In 1991, the USSR disbanded, and Robert stopped communicating with his handlers. He was worried that the instability would cause him to be exposed as a spy. In 1992, Robert tried to reestablish contact by directly approaching an official at the Russian embassy and saying his code name. He walked up to the official in the parking lot. The official did not recognize Robert's code name, and nothing happened to Robert. He avoided arrest. Robert hacked into the computer of another FBI agent in 1993. Once again, he managed to escape without being arrested, although now there was a lot of suspicion on him. Later, Robert searched FBI computers in an effort to figure out if he was being investigated. After failing to find anything, he resumed his spying activities. In 1999, he contacted the successor to the KGB, called the SVR. As this was going on, the FBI was still looking for the suspected spy. They ended up falsely accusing an agent for the CIA. Eventually, the FBI paid a Russian agent for information about the suspected spy. The agent didn't know Robert's name, but had an audio recording of his voice. The FBI recognized a phrase on the recording as one that Robert had used. In order to keep better track of Robert, he was promoted to a position managing FBI computer security in December 2000. Robert suspected that the FBI was onto him, but he still made another dead drop on February 18, 2001. He taped a package containing information under a bridge at a park in Virginia. The FBI arrested him at that time. Robert said to the agents, what took you so long? On July 6, 2001, Robert pleaded guilty to 13 counts of espionage, one count of attempted espionage, and one count of conspiracy to commit espionage. This guilty plea allowed him to avoid the death penalty. Less than a year later, Robert was sentenced to 15 terms of life in prison, all of them without the possibility of parole. He served his time in the notorious Federal Supermax Prison, ADX Florence, which is near Florence, Colorado. Robert Hansen died on June 5, 2023, at the age of 79. During his career as a spy, Robert did a lot of damage. He sold a tremendous amount of classified information for about $1.6 million dollars in cash and diamonds. Robert's case represents the most devastating security breach in the history of the United States. Now moving to my analysis. Here are my thoughts on a few items that stood out to me in this case. Item number one. As I mentioned, when Robert was young, he was mistreated frequently by his father. Just a few examples. When Robert was six or seven years old, he failed at a game of pin the tail on the donkey. Apparently, Robert had stuck the tail on the donkey's mouth, which led to his father insulting him. His father, Howard, spun Robert around until he became dizzy and vomited. Howard then shoved Robert's face into the vomit so he could experience the feeling of defeat. When Robert was old enough to drive, he went to take the test for his license, but he failed because his father bribed an official. Usually, a bribe works in the other direction, like to pass a test, but Howard wanted Robert to fail. Howard routinely criticized Robert's academic performance and humiliated him. Howard conducted this mistreatment in order to teach Robert how to be a real man. He was tragically and chronically disappointed with Robert and did not believe he was tough enough to survive in a harsh world. Howard was disgusted when Robert would show emotions, like through crying. Item number two, Robert was described as extremely impulsive. He would regularly take tremendous risks. For example, he sped around corners in his car to see how fast he could go before losing control, and he fired a rifle into a basement wall at close range. This sent concrete flying through the air. His friends said that Robert was so impulsive that they feared for their lives when they were around him. Item number three, when Robert was in the FBI, he did not get along with the other agents. They viewed Robert as arrogant, narrow-minded, overconfident, creepy, awkward, and inauthentic. When his co-workers would be talking in a group, 
Robert would wander over as if he was trying to listen to them. They described him as a lurker. Robert only wore starched black suits, which led to his coworkers calling him the mortician and Dr. Death. Robert reciprocated some of the negative feelings. He was offended by having to spend time with other agents because he believed that he was vastly superior. Robert was repeatedly aggravated that others failed to recognize his brilliance. He had a strong desire for power and authority. Robert felt as though he was underappreciated and underpaid by the FBI. Item number four, Robert was raised in a Lutheran family, but converted to Catholicism because his wife was Catholic. For most of their adult lives, Robert and Bonnie were devout members of a small organization in the Catholic community called Opus Dei. Robert regularly attended daily mass and represented himself as a devout Catholic. Other members of the Catholic Church, and specifically of Opus Dei, thought that Robert was disingenuous. They believed he had a cynical view of the Catholic Church, like he was faking his religious devotion. There are a few reasons that Robert would have been attracted to a small Catholic community. He probably liked the idea that it was secretive and mysterious. He felt special being a part of something that other people did not know about. A possible reason for being attracted to the Catholic Church in general would be the absolution component, like Robert felt as though he could violate the law, but the slate would be wiped clean after he went to confession. After one confession, a priest told Robert to stop committing espionage and give away the money that the Russians had paid him. Robert did not do either. Item number five, Robert had unusual compulsions regarding sex, including a fascination with voyeurism. A friend of Robert's named Jack was a retired army officer. Jack would sometimes watch Robert and Bonnie having sex. This is something that Robert recommended and facilitated. It wasn't like Jack was sneaking into their home or something. Eventually, Robert hid a video camera in his bedroom so that Jack could watch the sex from the den in Robert's house. Robert thought of Jack as manly because Jack had been in the military. Robert wanted to show Jack how he had tremendous sexual abilities. He had a need to earn Jack's acceptance and to convince Jack that he was a real man. Robert liked the idea of other people seeing his wife naked. He posted nude photos of Bonnie on internet sites and typed long detailed descriptions about him and his wife, like scenarios where she would be getting undressed and somebody would see her. These descriptions contained information which could have easily led to Robert's identity. Robert had a two-year relationship with a clothing-challenged dancer in Washington, D.C. named Priscilla. He gave her jewels, cash, and a used Mercedes-Benz. He ended contact with her before he was arrested because she reunited with a previous boyfriend and moved away. Priscilla would later say that Robert tried to convert her to Catholicism. Item number six, as I mentioned, the Russians never knew Robert's identity. He approached a Russian official in person on one occasion, but that official did not identify Robert. The Russian handlers recognized that Robert was needy and dependent, even without knowing who he really was. They could tell that he was in search of companionship, friendship, attachment, and approval. They continuously thanked him and praised his abilities and intelligence. The Russians were able to meet Robert's emotional needs better than the FBI or than Robert's father. Item number seven, Robert and Bonnie raised six children, three sons and three daughters. The children went to private Catholic schools. Robert would brag about their academic achievements and represent himself as a devoted father. He also indicated how he was a great husband. There were a few clues that Robert was a spy. For example, his brother-in-law spotted a lot of cash sitting on a dresser in Robert's home, and Robert had that relationship with the dancer. Despite these examples, Robert lived a fairly ordinary life for the most part. He did not attract a lot of attention through his personal life. His behavior at work is what attracted suspicion, like frequently searching his name on FBI computers. Now moving to the final item, number eight. What do I think happened in this case? This is just a theory, my opinion. When Robert was young, his father's terrible behavior toward him made him feel as though he could never be good enough. He would never be able to please his father. He would never be able to be a real man. Robert was destined to fail 
and disappoint everyone around him. Robert internalized all this shame and became narcissistic in order to protect his fragile sense of self. He developed a sense of entitlement and a lack of empathy. He became grandiose, arrogant, condescending, and manipulative. Robert also had psychopathic traits. He was impulsive, irresponsible, and excitement-seeking. He committed crimes, had superficial charm, and lacked remorse. After spending a few years in the FBI, Robert started to view the organization as he viewed his father. The FBI took over the role of his father. They embarrassed him. They thought he was never good enough. They failed to recognize his greatness. He was not special to the FBI. Robert thought of them as a harmful and invalidating entity who he could never please. Robert became angry. He desperately wanted approval and recognition, but he was not getting it. He looked for a way to hurt the FBI as badly as they hurt him. Espionage was the method he selected, and he was quite effective at causing tremendous damage. Robert was satisfied with his revenge. He enjoyed having a sense of power, and he liked the intrigue of being a spy. It fit well with his excitement-seeking and his desire to feel special. Robert did not want to get caught, mostly because of the life in prison part, but at the same time, he clearly knew he was at risk. For him, the benefit of avoiding arrest was continued freedom, but the downside was not getting the recognition he deserved. At some level, Robert wanted the FBI to know that he was the one who betrayed them. He was the one who beat them at their own game. He was victorious. They were not capable of outsmarting him. In one sense, Robert engaged in espionage to obtain revenge against his father. Robert was finally able to demonstrate that he had the power to be a real man. He had finally been able to pin the tail on the donkey. Those are my thoughts on the case of Robert Hansen. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be informative. Thanks for watching.